Thank you. Uh, I am really not used to having a microphone, so this is, this is very strange for me. Uh, I'm, I'm usually very loud, so I have to tone it down a bit. My name is Troy Payne. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, I'm a professor of justice, and so what I do is an entirely different sort of thing um, from what Mr. Skidmore does. I'm a completely different sort of nerd. <laughs> Uh, he went to law school and I went to graduate school. So I'm going to take a little bit broader view. And I'm simultaneously very glad that, that he was here to talk to you about Alaska law because honestly I didn't know most of that. And I'm also very sad that I have to go after him because it was a very good presentation. I'll talk a little bit about the way that this works in other states. The sort of basic definition of this is hard to come by, honestly, because standard ground means so many different things. And it's been used as the sort of catchphrase in the media to mean so many different things. But the basic idea is to extend the castle doctrine beyond the walls of someone's home or fixed place of business. And so as we were talking about, or as uh, Mr. Skidmore was talking about, it's really about removing this duty to retreat. And then there are other elements of changes to self-defense laws that sort of get wrapped up in this discussion that are quite different. So for those of you that don't know anything about the, the way that criminal laws work in the United States, it may come as some surprise to you that different states have entirely different laws about things as basic as self-defense, uh, but they do. And it makes it really sort of um, maddening to teach this at an introductory level, because if I start talking to students in an introductory justice course about what self-defense is, I have to clarify, well, where are we talking about it? That's why I'm very glad that you were able to give a, a detailed description of this. In some states, stand your ground includes no duty to retreat and defense of property. In some states, you can use deadly force even to defend property, even against trespass. In some states, stand your ground includes a presumption that the use of deadly force is lawful, a rebuttable presumption, but a presumption nonetheless. In some states, as he was talking about earlier, the standard grounds of the changes that have been made in self-defense law provide immunity from prosecution. In Florida, one of the big issues with the Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman case is that there was a question about whether or not the police could lawfully arrest Zimmerman because of the way the law was written in Florida. In Florida, the police have to have probable cause to believe that a claim of self-defense is wrong in order to affect an arrest. And so this question of whether it was self-defense comes much earlier in the process than it does here in Alaska, but that's a question of fact for the jury. In some states, these changes to self-defense laws have included a, a, a provision for immunity from civil lawsuits as well as immunity from prosecution or immunity from arrest. And again, for those of you that are not really familiar with the way that the law works, there's a difference between civil law and criminal law. And so it's entirely possible for someone to uh, not get prosecuted but still get sued in civil court. The standards of proof are different. The, the difference between civil and criminal law could fill a 15-week class that I'm glad I don't have to teach. <laughs> Near as I can figure it, if we include a sort of expansive definition of what standard ground is and these changes to self-defense laws, 22 states have enacted changes to their self-defense laws since 2005. These changes are not uniform, they didn't all come at the same time, and uh, definitely the leader in this is Florida. Florida was the first state to do this. The question about where did these laws even come from? Why are these changes to self-defense happening throughout the country? I mean, 22 states 
is almost half of them. And we have 50 states. And so we've had these major changes of self-defense in half of the country. Not quite, almost. Standard ground laws were championed by the National Rival Association and other conservative groups, uh, primarily the American Legislative Exchange Council, or commonly referred to as ALEC. And ALEC adopted several changes to self-defense laws as part of their model statutes. Depending on one's political persuasion, this is either good news or bad news. I'll leave that up to you to make a decision about that. But there are some legitimate concerns about being prosecuted for having used self-defense. One of the problems with the way that Alaska handles self-defense, is a question for the jury, is if you have someone that uh, has a legitimate claim of self-defense, even if the prosecutor disagrees, with all due respect to it. If, there is, because if, if the prosecutor agreed with that, they wouldn't bring the charges in the first place, they would have gotten dismissed. But if you have a legitimate claim of self-defense, and the jury agrees with you, you still have gone through that whole prosecution process. And if it's deadly force, you're talking about a homicide or manslaughter defense, and that's incredibly expensive. I mean, you're talking the sorts of things that completely destroy financial lives. So there's a legitimate concern on the part of these advocacy groups for people that have a legitimate claim of self-defense and get prosecuted. The NRA's Institute for Legislative Action has uh, published a handful uh, of stories that uh, narratives uh, of events where this has happened and sort of where this came from. It's worth mentioning that you can't claim that any of these changes to self-defense law came about because of a national crime increase. You can't claim that, as any of my students know, because there's no such thing as a national crime increase. Not in the past 20 years. Crime has been declining since the mid-90s. In particular, homicide has dropped by half since its peak in the mid-90s. And so there's, there's not a national crime increase that's been driving the, these laws. It's driven by the political process and by concerns about, about um, being prosecuted. So, I'm an, I'm an academic. I'm, as I said, a certain type of group. We are slow. We take several years to figure out what the effects are of any particular legislation, and it can be really difficult to assign causes and effects to legislation for a huge variety of reasons that, again, can fill a 15-week class, but that one I'm happy to teach. There's often investigative reporting that is suggestive of after changes to the law. Uh, the Tampa Bay Times in Florida has done some of this work. They published a story in July 2012 that looked at 119 uh, invocations of Florida standard ground law uh, in between 2005 when it was enacted and 2012, they found about 60% of the people that invoked standard ground had prior arrests. And contrary to the sort of legal theory that brought these things about, about 64% of the victims also had criminal records. Which, again, if you're unfamiliar with uh, criminal justice and criminology, it's going to be surprising to you, but quite often victims and offenders are not mutually exclusive groups. They tend to overlap a bit. Uh, roughly two-thirds of the people that invoke standard ground in this uh, Tampa Bay Times investigative report, roughly two-thirds of the people that invoked it were successful. That success rate drops with the more prior arrests they had. So if they had more prior arrests, that success rate drops. Although it was still 45% successful, even though they had three or more arrests. As much as I like investigative reporting, and as, as important as it is, it's not social science. And so, to me, I, I have to be very careful about citing that as evidence. 
There are, unfortunately, very few academic studies that we can rely on that use uh, appropriate methods, the sorts of methods that we use in criminology and criminal justice. And as I was preparing for this, I was trying to just make the find two studies uh, that looked at the effects broadly from an, an academic standpoint. And there are definitely investigative reports, there are definitely advocacy groups on one side or the other that have produced research that is valuable, but it's outside of the academic literature. And, and I, I suspect that you can bring up some of that in a bit. So I found two studies, both of which are in the gray literature, which is what we call the uh, literature that's not quite published and peer-reviewed yet, so these are very, very tentative findings. The first of these studies I'm going to talk about looked at the effects of standard ground laws on firearms injuries using what's called the vital statistics. And so the Centers for Disease Control collects a whole bunch of statistics about injury and death, and, and it's a, a major data source for epidemiology studies and economics and chronology and criminal justice and lots of other things. McClellan and Turkin found when they examined before and after standard ground laws went into effect in several states, they found increases in homicide and increases in justifiable homicide. So you would expect, after a standard ground law goes into effect, by the way, that you have an increase in justifiable homicides, right? You may have some homicides that would not have been justifiable under the previous law that become justifiable. Interestingly, and somewhat counter to, uh, to some of the assumptions about this, the increase in homicides that was found was driven primarily by white males. And what they found was an increase of 28 to 33 white males killed each month, on average, after these standard ground laws were enacted in the states. Uh, if I had to guess, a lot of the reason behind that is due to firearms ownership demographics. Uh, white males are more likely to own firearms than other demographic groups. Another study, again, from the great literature uh, from Ching and Hofstra, found no deterrent effect of standing the ground on burglary, robbery, and aggravated assault uh, using uniform crime reports uh, data from the FBI. And so one of the claims that comes from you know, expanding self-defense is that it will reduce crime. And these authors found that not to be the case. And so relative increases of uh, about 10% and homicides after standing ground laws went into effect. And they again found increases in both justified and non-justified homicides. Uh, these folks, these authors, are economists, and so that explains their conclusion. Their conclusion was that lowering the expected cost of lethal force causes there to be more of it. It's a very economic method of describing this. So rather like if you lower the price of a loaf of bread, people will buy more bread. If you lower the expected consequences to come from violence, these authors found you're going to get more violence. I don't have better information. I wish I had more studies. I wish I had more studies to do a meta-analysis. I wish I had studies with better methods and longer data, um, uh, longer data series to actually look at this. I, I, I wish there was even some standardization across the states so that we're talking about the same thing. It's one of the problems with, with these studies is that they combine states that have very, very different laws and very different cultures and very different base rates of violence. And so I, I really don't want to give you the impression that this is the last word on this. It absolutely is not. This is an area of active research, the law is being actively changed as well, and we're sort of chasing a, a very difficult target to hit when we're looking at this sort of research. Um, I do have, for those of you that are interested and want to see some of the, the actual text of the studies, I have links to those. I'm not uh, expecting anyone to be able to actually write those down, but I, but I have them if you're, if you're so interested. And you can come up to me afterwards or during the Q&A, I can explain some of that. 
That's all I have. Thank you very much for your time.